Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks again to the organizers for not just having me once, but twice, which is very special. Um, so now I'm going to tell, give you the evidence on Whipples. And I know uh, this afternoon at half past five at this room, Guralp, where are you? It's going to have a, there you are, wonderful debate on minimally evasive versus open against you. So I'm very interested to see who will win that debate. I will already give a little bit of the data now. So the first laparoscopic Whipple uh, was introduced in 1994. Um, since then, many systematic reviews suggesting, on, based on non-randomized trials, that minimally evasive Whipple reduces blood loss, less delayed gas emptying, and short hospital stay. But these studies were non-randomized. And what the studies also showed, that if you start doing minimally invasive Whipple, and you do less than 10 per year, less than 10 per year of minimally invasive Whipple, the mortality is higher than open. So let me start with that. I think it's very clear. So we did the training program in the Netherlands I showed you for the distal. That was the Laylabs uh, 1. But we also did a training program for laparoscopic Whipple, which is Laylabs 2. And in my last two slides, I'll show a little bit about the training program now, which is about to close, is LILAPS 3 for Robot Whipple. So first, the LILAPS 2 training program we finished for laparoscopic Whipple in the Netherlands. Again, as for the distals, we had a very detailed description of the technique. We worked with our friend, Baki Tupal, who is a highly experienced surgeon from Leuven in Belgium. We made videos. We um, as many surgeons as possible had a 3D system, which I think is not very good for the dissection in laparoscopy, but for the anastomosis, it really helps a lot. So we also did a small randomized trial with biotissue in an uh, experimental setting. And even for experienced surgeons, 3D reduces the time to complete anastomosis with 15%, even in bariatric surgeons who do only suture. So it's it really helpful for the anastomosis. We trained with biotissue, so you can buy these biotissues, put them in a box trainer, and you can practice all the anastomosis. So I think that's very useful. So first surgeons went to go to Leuven to see Professor Topal do a Whipple, and then Topal came to them, and at some point I started giving training myself as well. So we did the training, and we published the results. Uh, we published the first 114 patients, in annals of surgery. So we published the results of the first four centers that started training. And of these four centers, we included the first case, and after that, every case was included. So most series you read, they will not report the first 20. You will never hear about the first 20. And you know why, OK? Because results are bad. But we presented from case number one. During the training program in these centers, the median volume um, was 19 laparoscopic whipples per year during the training program. 19 laparoscopic whipples per year, which is basically the whipples without any signs of vascular involvement and a BMI less than 35. That's basically the selection criteria. Then we had 10% conversion, 35% pancreatic fistula, and a 3.5% mortality rate, which I think is pretty OK. Remember, these are not the big pancreatic cancers with the hard pancreas. These are the most small soft ampullomas, small distal cholangios, and they have a higher leak rate. So we were happy. And we made the same deal as with the distals. We said immediately after the training, we want to do the randomized trial. We do not want to do a randomized trial after we've done 100, because that's not fair. Because in, in real life, you need to know for your patients if this is a safe technique or not. And we did this trial. And it was published in Lancet Gastroenterology um, earlier this year. And the results were surprising, if not a bit shocking. So the same four hospitals as published their results in Annals of Surgery participated in the trial. And there were strict quality criteria for these four hospitals. All surgeons needed to have completed the training programs for distal and Whipple. Each of the surgeons needed to have done more than 50 advanced laparoscopic GI cases and more than 20 laparoscopic Whipples before the trial, at least 50 open, working in centers doing at least 20 Whipples per year, doing at least 10 laparoscopic Whipples per year, and every case 
was done by two surgeons who fulfill all these criteria. So two senior surgeons did all the cases. This was one, uh, one center was the biggest, which was ours. We do 100 Whipples per year, and the other three were smaller. But then, after 99 patients, the Data Safety Monitoring Board advised us very strongly to stop the trial because there was a 10% mortality in laparoscopic Whipple and 2% mortality in open Whipple. There could have been benefits if we continued the trial, but of course we do not want to take risks with our patients, so we stopped the trial. And the time to functional recovery was not better with laparoscopic Whipple, so there was no benefit. So why take the risk? So we stopped the trial. What happened? In two hospitals, during surgery, there was an interoperative damage of the SMA or the SMV. One of these was unintentional, and one of these was intentional, where they cut the SMV, thinking the IMV would solve the problem. There were two big hemorrhages, and one in open, and one patient died from a fistula. Actually, this was a fistula being done open, because this case was converted very early. So it was an open anastomosis, but that doesn't care because it's an intention to treat analysis, of course. And then the leak rate between lab and open, that has always been the concern. There was no difference in the leak rate. The leak rate was the same. And you can train the anastomosis. And also the hepatogegenostomy leak rate, I think this is too high, by the way. 12 for open is much too high but also no difference between laparoscopic and open. Complications, a bit more laparoscopic but not significant. Delayed gastric emptying, hemorrhage, surgical reintervention and ICU admission all were a bit worse for laparoscopic but not significant because of the small numbers. And then hospital stay, that's what we wanted to improve, time to recovery, no improvement with laparoscopic whip. And then, as I mentioned, mortality, and there were two more deaths due to metastasis long after recovery. So, this is concerning. Is there more data? Yes. There are two more randomized trials. First, the trial from Palanivello's group in India. This is a very experienced group, and before they started the trial, they did more than 100 laparoscopic whipples before they started the trial. So you see here that the uh, conversion rate was 3%. The mortality was 3% in both groups. Complications were the same. The fistula rate was the same, maybe a bit less, but not significantly less. And the hospital stay was six days shorter in the laparoscopic group. I still think it's quite a long hospital stay, but in India you're only discharged when you're fully recovered, so that's explained it. So this was a positive trial from India. Then in Yazi Poves from Barcelona, who unfortunately recently uh, died because of uh, brain cancer, he did an excellent trial. He is a bariatric surgeon who went to do uh, Whipples. His center does not do as many as India, but he's highly experienced. Conversion rate in his trial was 23%, which is quite high. Mortality laparoscopic Whipple, zero. Complication rate actually significantly less with laparoscopic Whipple. Fistula grade, not significantly, but a bit less. And hospital stay, again, less, but also I think these are quite um, long hospital stays. Nevertheless, also regarded as a positive trial. So the PLOT trial from India, BGS, and the PADULA trial from Spain in Annals of Surgery, two positive trials. So with the EMIPS group, we did a European study. We combined all data from the uh, European, Middle East, and Africa region, and we saw for minimally invasive Whipple mortality was 4% for open 3%, so no difference. Complication, no difference. Fistula rate, minimally invasive, twice as high. So this was both robot and laparoscopic Whipple, twice as high, and hospital stay the same. But when we dug a little bit deeper into this data, we found some very interesting findings. First, the conversion rate was much less, five times smaller with robot Whipple. Much smaller conversion rate. Mortality between lab and robot was the same. But we found that the difference 
the increase in fistula could, for a very, very large part, be subscribed to people doing a single layer running anastomosis. Anyone doing a double layer anastomosis, either lab or robot, had the same leak rate than open. And I think you can imagine that single layer, if you do it open, you can, you can get it right, but it's more difficult laparoscopically or robot, so you need a second layer. And uh, for instance, the modified Bloomgard technique is a very simple technique that allows you to do so. So to put it in one slide for you, red is bad, green is good, orange is in the middle. These are the studies I just mentioned to you, the Dutch trial, the trial from India, the trial from Spain, and the big European group. So mortality worse here, in the rest it's orange, fistula, orange, and here in the European worse, more fistula, but because of single layer, and green only here, hospital stay. So I think the debate is not closed and we're looking forward to this afternoon to see what you guys uh, make of it. My final point, uh, Mr. Chairman, is about volume. I think this is very important. These are two studies from United States data showing here the complication rate and here the annual volume of minimally invasive. But only after you do 22 minimally invasive per year, it stabilizes, okay? And you see here the volume for open, which is the dark line, and the volume for minimally invasive. Only if you do here 62 in two years, so more than 30 in one year, is the mortality for minimally invasive and open the same. So minimally invasive can be good, maybe even better, but you need to do it a lot. Otherwise, I would not do it. I think that's the main point. That's also in the Miami guidelines. It says that center volume strongly affects outcomes. If you do less than 20 per year, outcomes are worse. So I think this is a key, key point to take home with you. And of course, as I mentioned before, the inclusion of these patients should be in registries. I think if you do minimally invasive Whipple, it's very wise to put the patients in the registry. If outcomes are bad, at least you can show your hospital administration, look, they're just as bad as elsewhere. Even to protect yourself, I think you should put these data in the registry. And as mentioned before, Vatican is the Turkey country lead for the EMIPS uh, registry. So finally, my one, just one slide on this. We started um, the training program for robot Whipple in the Netherlands. We had several meetings with the Dutch HPB Surgeon Society, and we decided we stop doing laparoscopic Whipple completely in the Netherlands. So no one is doing laparoscopic Whipple anymore. I was a bit sad, but I actually I liked the operation, and our results were not that bad, were pretty good, but we said we stand united as a country, everyone, we stop. Fortunately, of course, we had an alternative, which is the robot. So the smaller centers stopped with laparoscopic Whipple, and they are now working together with bigger centers to do the, the, all the cases in one hospital, and the surgeon comes with the patient to the big hospital to do the surgery there. And maybe they get back a Whipple that can be not, not be done laparoscopically, so the volume and the money stays the same. So again, we did a training program, very detailed, a lot of videos, proctoring in Pisa and Pittsburgh, and we flew in, Dr. Surai got uh, Melissa Hoke and Herb Say, they came flying to the Netherlands, and you know, of course, which company paid for the flights, but that's okay. And uh, now 10 centers are participating in a training program, for instance, in my center in Amsterdam, for the past 12 months, we do a robot Whipple every mo Monday. Every Monday morning is a robot Whipple. And if you do less, the quality is just not going to be as good as you like. So you need to do it a lot. We have done now more than 250 uh, robot Whipples in the Netherlands. The mortality is clearly below 4%, and we will soon uh, publish the results. And finally, uh, we now got funding uh, to start a European training program within EMIPS. If you are an EMIPS member and you can do 20 robot Whipples, someone will come to your center with the bio tissue, with the training program to train for robot Whipple. And I think this is really the next step because we need to collaborate. So finally, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the lessons learned is that minimally invasive Whipple should probably only be done if you can do of the minimally invasive cases at least 20 per year. Just look at the Dutch numbers. In the Dutch training program, when we did 19 per year, mortality was 3.5. But during the trial in the same centers, same surgeons, when they only did 11 per year, mortality went up to 10%. And if you do something only 10 times per year, of course you're going to be not be as good at it as you do more. So the benefit for laparoscopic Whipple is unclear. 
You can train very well the robot Whipple with the Pittsburgh approach. Robot Whipple will reduce conversion rate as compared to laparoscopic Whipple. And I think you get the message by now that the Miami guidelines strongly advise participation in the registry. So thank you again, and thanks to all the PhD students who did all the work. Thank you.